I'm Cindy Palos, and I am honored to have one of the men I find such an inspiration. I find Kabir Segal to be one of the most uh, prolific and inspiring people I know. And every time I turn around, there's like some massive, <laughs> impressive new project happening. Um, he's the founder and CEO of Tiger uh, Turn, and it's a multimedia production company that makes films and music. And boy, has he been doing a lot of that. Um, he's also a New York Times, Wall Street Journal bestselling author of 16 books and seven nonfiction books. And they just keep coming, hit after hit after hit. You've been on um, many great shows see, on CNN, PBS, NPR. It goes on and on Fox News, National Geographic and all that. I have to first ask you, um, the book is going to be out in a day or two. July 13th is the release. And, and if John Lewis was sitting right here in front of you now, what would you tell him about the book? that you learned while in the process? Because we learn quite a bit, I know, as we write books. What did, would you tell him about your book? Sure, sure. Well, a couple of things first. I want to just begin. Thanks for having me on. In addition to all those August shows, it's wonderful being on your August uh, show, as always. Um, and I also want to see my, I'm from Atlanta. I'm in Atlanta right now. I grew up with Ambassador Andrew Young. Andrew Young is my is my godfather, civil rights legend, Marshal Dr. Dr. King. And, uh, you know, growing up in Atlanta in the 98, like late 80s, 90s, you think about a lot of these civil rights leaders were in their 50s and 60s. They were kind of in their prime and in leadership positions. Uh, Andrew Young was the mayor of Atlanta. Maynard Jackson was the mayor of uh, Atlanta. John Lewis was in Congress. And so I got to witness firsthand the incredible um, successes and obstacles they had to overcome. So John Lewis, this book came together and it's through a series of conversations. And these are really it's really his wisdom, you know, through, through the recordings that we captured on the on the, on audio tape. And um, I would just, if he were around, I would like to, I would just hope, I would present on the book and say, hope this, you know, <laughs> you're happy with um, with uh, everything that's, that, that's here. And um, I, I have a feeling he would because, you know, it's his, it, it all came from, he's the fountainhead of all this uh, inspiration. And uh, boy, are, am I glad that he left us with these words of wisdom for the next generation that we can return to in the years ahead for inspiration. When you, and it, the subtitles reflections for new generation. And it's so interesting to think of what both Andrew Young and John Lewis went through when they were your age. And I'm sure you probably reflected on that as you were writing this, of the amazing changes that we've seen and at the same time, the things that were not quite ready to be changed that had to be brought out, um, to be recognized, that were still in the, the, the after effects of people realizing that there were people who hadn't quite accepted these changes that are still having to, to um, have their minds opened up. So when you looked at that change from when they were young and what they went through to what we're going through and what you're going through and what a lot of young people are going through now. How did you see that bridge and the connection from what they went through to what you see people going through now in the search for equality? Terrific question. And there's certainly parallels, you know, uh, both John Lewis and Ambassador Young be what often say that the world doesn't change, it grows. And Growth takes time. And, you know, John Lewis marched in Selma on Bloody Sunday. He almost died in his quest for equality and voting rights. And it's, uh, I had the great privilege of traveling with him to the Edmund Pettus Bridge and hearing him recount that story firsthand. And, you know, it's the, the Voting Rights Act, um, you know, it was, it was enacted in 1965. It, it became law. But here we are in a and, and a U.S. Uh, with the Supreme Court, with the previous administration enacting legislation or laws and from state by state that arose the very foundation of the Voting Rights Act. And so that's a really a clarion call for the young generation to say, we can't slide backwards. People, too many people have put their blood, sacrifice, sweat, tears to put us in a position that we can be part of this American experience. And I got to tell you, Cindy, 
I left Atlanta when I was uh, 18. You know, I went to college and I, I didn't move back until the pandemic. And when I left this very district that I'm in, um, it was the district of New Gingrich. It was very conservative. It was very, you know, it was, I went to school and people wore Confederate belt buckles on their belts. And they, were, they <laughs> talked about the war of Northern aggression. And I came back this past year because of the pandemic and the sixth district is um, incredibly diverse. It's the sixth most well-educated district. Um, uh, Lucy, Lucy McBath is the Congresswoman. There's fewer red lobsters. There's more um, uh, Vietnamese restaurants and the incredible diversity that's, that I've seen just in the years I was away um, shows that places grow, people grow, communities grow. And we just have to remind each other that we're in John Lewis in the book. He always talks about how we're, there's an American house. We all have, to, all have to live together. If something's out of whack in Hawaii, it affects what happens in, in Georgia. And we all have to be in harmony together. So this book, Carry On, is really, um, it's really like, I don't want to say it's marching orders, but it's really kind of a template. It, it's a nice introduction of how they thought during the civil rights movement, because we're sure facing many challenges on the horizon as a country. And young people today who are picking up the, the, the beacon and the mantle have to uh, return to these pages for inspiration. I totally, totally agree with you there. It is, uh, has been a time of a lot of change and we kind of saw that as you just could kind of express in this last year and a half of the pandemic, how people also had time to reflect and change. And of course you moving back there uh, brought about changes as well. Um, and at the same time, we're looking at more people who are dedicated, wanting to get involved. We are seeing more women involved and more people of color and race involved in, in government. Have you ever thought of getting involved? Because, you know, here you've got this heritage in, in your life. And have you ever thought of getting involved in politics or is it just something that is, is too difficult to deal with, with the bureaucracy and, and, and the, pol the politics is a hard thing. And I'm sure you thought of that when you were reading and writing about John Lewis and, and you certainly must have heard about it from Andrew Young. Did they, would they want you to get involved in politics, you think? Um, probably not. And the reason I say is this, because it was, you know, John Lewis, who's a, an acolyte of, of Dr. King, who said anyone could be great because anyone, anyone can serve. And service is, comes in multiple ways. I think of service as uh, what I do in, in the military, um, through, you know, in my reserve work. I think of service as um, the music I make, which is trying to shine a light on, on political issues that bring people together, or writing a book like, like uh, and working with, with uh, Congressman John Lewis. And on this book is a way to inspire the next generation. So you don't have to work in the cause in the halls of Congress. It takes a special patience to, to work there, determination, um, maybe stubbornness. And John Lewis was nothing but steadfast and determined and dogged, and he was resolute. And that's what we all loved about him. Um, I so, think that might get too frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. I just talked to Rotary, a Rotary here in Wailuku this last week. So I looked up their principles and, and service is a major part of them. So I just gave a talk about service. And, you know, it made me reflect this whole last week on that term service. And, and you know, some of us feel like, well, service is going out and feeding people who don't have food or it's this or that. But, you know, you I had to smile when you brought up that word because it's kind of very synchronistic right now because I've been reflecting for days on service. And indeed, service comes in many colors, in many ways, and it is reflected in what you feel that you can give from your purpose in life to others that will shine a light on their life as well. And I, I do agree, your work that you do is, is of great service. And, and at the same time, we look at people that we need um, to serve, you know, and, and there's really, I think, oh gosh, I forget who said there's a, a, a thousand or a million points of light but, uh, but George, are, George Bush, which right, also right, right. I truly surprised me of, of all the things that he said that he said that. But there are, there's lots of people who have goodwill and who are serving to help awaken and enlighten people's minds, which is, I believe, 
I believe through music and books, um, that's one of the very big ways it is happening. And at the same time, you look at um, the influence still through John Lewis and Andrew Young that Martin Luther King had. And here was a man who understand the real dream and, and was able through his service to and dedication, knowing the price, knowing that price, still knowing that he was going to serve peace and 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 also free people from the, the terrible chains of prejudice and, and hatred and bigotry, um, and yet able to carry it out in the way that he uniquely could. And, and, and look at how he influenced, I thought of John Lewis when I was thinking about talking to you. And I thought he was a man who understood that he could serve and it wasn't a matter of ever wanting to overshadow anyone, but he served Martin Luther King's dream in an interesting way. Did you find that when you went through the, when you were writing your book, how did you find that special energy of service of his service to people and to Martin Luther King's dream? Well, you know, um, John Lewis wrote a letter to uh, Dr. King and um, and he was just a, just a teenager and um, Martin Luther King and they offered to pay his, his fare and he met Rosa Parks, uh, John Lewis and then Martin Luther King and it changed his life forever. In, in the book, John Lewis talks about his big inspirations, his mentors are, are Dr. King. And he, uh, in fact, he tells the story of, you know, loving, there was a comic book about Dr. King that he loved reading because it made the story accessible to him as a, as a young person. But John Lewis, when he went to um, university, he would always be there in his suit and going to the last of the restaurants to, to desegregate. He was focused on that. He went to training and, you know, he would get trained on um, sitting at a lunch counter, people yelling in his ears, getting pushed mm -hmm. because he knew when he, he knew when he came out of training and into the into the uh, actual restaurant, he was going to experience that. And it was quite frightening. And you know, in this book, John Lewis talks about, you know, fear and hope, never to lose hope because the, in the, the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice and things will, if you do right, if you speak up, if you, if you stand up, speak up, get into what he loved to say, good trouble. John Lewis was arrested some f over 40 times. Wow. Uh, and he was arrested so, several of those times while he was in Congress. And that's a direct lesson he learned from the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, the writings of Tolstoy, talking about civil disobedience. It's never okay to riot and protest. Last, last year, before Congressman Lewis passed away, um, what was happening in the world? It was the Black Lives Matter protests. It was the George Floyd killings. He always, he for sure empathized with the, and felt the agony and the anguish the death of George Floyd reminded him of Emmett Till. He writes that in the book. But he also said, you know, rioting is not a revolution. Rioting is not the way. Destruction is so it's more destruction. If you take the path of nonviolence, you have the moral high ground. So he remained determined to make sure that young activists know that nonviolence is not uncool. Nonviolence is actually a very hip way of thinking because it's one of the best ways of creating social change. And I got to tell you, Cindy, one of the reasons I love music making, one of the reasons I love making film, um, because I, I grew up hearing stories from John Lewis and Andy Young about the production of the civil rights movement. What I mean by that is they would time their marches just around the time of the evening news so yes, that yes. so that all eyes would be on it they didn't do it in the middle of the night i mean sometimes they in the middle of, they want to make sure they got maximum eyeballs they thought like real producers and how do how do we <laughs> because they wanted to maximize the effect of whatever the social issue they were magnifying and in my little way I, i've tried to pick dreamers or us mexico relations and use that same concept of, of, through arts and music and literature to carry on this book hopefully it's a mode of of saying something that sticks with people a little longer than just, you know, a conversation. Just when you create art, it's a work of timelessness. And I'm so glad that um, Congressman John Lewis has, has given us these pages. 
Had you thought, because you did do a beautiful job with Van Dango at the wall, you made it into a movie. And I know you did do one for a play for stage um, also. Have you thought of maybe taking this to the stage or making it into a movie? It'd be great, it'd be great. And the more people who learn about the life and lessons of John Lewis, um, the better. And you know, I hope everyone reads Carry On. And um, based on the success of Carry On, hope, hope we can take it to another level. Um, but right now I'm just uh, enjoying this, this project. You can imagine this project has been a very, um, I would say tumultuous, emotionally tumultuous time because he passed away um, in the midst of you know, putting this project together. And uh, it, it was very kind of sad. Um, and I, this took a lot out, everyone who worked on this project, it took a lot out of us emotionally to kind of carry on, if you will, to, to make sure that this book comes out and it's being published posthumously. Um, I wish you were here to see it. So I think let's just could pass the emotional <laughs> release of the next few weeks and then reevaluate what, what the next step is with, um, with this project. What did you learn from writing this book? I learned um, not to give up hope. And, and that's something I'd heard a lot of my life, but with, when you go back and understand what this man went through, it is a remarkable American story. It is one of the most beautiful American stories. I mean, a man who just as a young kid, I mean, as Obama said, I think in his eulogy, he, he made us a little bit closer to, you know, that more perfect union of like, standing up against injustice and risking his life for it. And that is something I've often, well, what I risk my life for. And then Dr. King said, if you're not willing to risk your life for something, what are you willing to live for? You know, what's, what's the point of life? What do you believe in? So um, I learned now to, to move even more with a sense of purpose in the projects I take on. Um, we're not here for very long. Congressman Lewis talks about that. He, he says in his book, we only, we only pass this way once. Make it count. So when I think about whatever project I take on, I want to make it count, you know? So that's, that's what I learned. You know, you, you can't create as many projects as you have created without a sense of purpose. And also your sense of understanding teamwork and also um, how the economics works. And I think you've got a very wonderful uh, base of understanding economics and how to organize teamworks and, and to reach out to people to make things happen. I've seen this in so many of your wonderful projects. And, and how did you, and I guess, when did you get that feeling of your sense of purpose? When because it kind of is almost like at some point you get it, you know, did you find in your life some point where you just got that you had a sense of purpose? Uh, well, it's very, very kind of you to say, I, I think it's the, I think it's being exposed to people like John Lewis, Ambassador Young at, at a young age. I remember Atlanta in the nineties was an incredible place to be. We had the international, we had the centennial Olympic games. We had it, this, the whole world came here when I was a kid and I, I, I realized that you can, if you can dream it, you can try to make it happen. Um, you just got to stick with it. And so it was those early conversations with Congressman Lewis, with Ambassador Young, with my father, who, um, who exposed me to me. And that's why I'm very blessed um, with these things. But it's not, of course, um, what you were given is, is what you do with it. So I hope that, I hope that um, these pages and carry on are something that instills such a purpose and, and whoever, reads, whoever reads it. Well, I, I get that. I get that from you. You have that, um, that work ethic and that integrity, um, which you do do your work with. And, and because of that, um, I see that you create amazing projects. And did you tell me about your, your teamwork and how you build the foundation to create as many projects as you do? Yeah, well, <laughs> sometimes it feels like an army of one or a navy of one. I'm sure you need a propeller to just push it. But, um, you know, every, every project is different and every project takes, I, I, I think it's, you have to sort of think, what is the purpose of project? How do we, how do we put the, the realization of the project above really all else? And, and that way you kind of do it without put, put aside egos. And if you're making decisions that advance the project or the truth you're trying to share with the world, it cuts through a lot of the noise and, 
I try to pick people, work with people I, I trust and worked with for years. And um, I was, I was like being challenged and my way is not always the best way. Um, I've learned that in easy ways and hard ways. I've made plenty of um, uh, mistakes, but it's just, but also having a light touch, you know, it's, if you say something, do it. If you say, um, let's go out for lunch, let's go out for lunch. If you say, I'm going to get back to you by Friday, close the business, get back to the person Friday, close the business. Don't let it drift. So we've talked about always close the loop. Always just get back to people and it creates a sense of momentum. Um, because even the smallest things people remember, you know, that he said something, you didn't do it. Well, so, and there's very few people, Cindy, I, um, I can, uh, I work with in a sense because I need people who are reliable and, and who I can collaborate with. And it creates a sense of like, all right, let's just get it done. Um, which is why I work with a lot of the same artists wise, the Arturo Farrell, the John Diversas, Ted Nash's, they're really good at what they do. And they just, they, they, they deliver when they say they will. And when that happens, you know, anything can happen. That's true. Um, let's go to the title uh, before we close out. Um, you know, I have used that phrase, of course, so did uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, <laughs> carry on, love is coming. Um, why and how did you come up with the title? I know it's always a, quite an interesting process coming up with the title because people can judge reading a book by the titles. How did you come up with carry on? Well, you know, this This is, an, uh, this is a frequent kind of saying of, of um, John Lewis, we must carry on. Um, it reminds me a little bit of the um, spirituals, uh, the blues spiritual, you know, and they, they hear it during the Civil Rights Movement. Music was, it was so many great music uh, or songs were just the soundtrack of We Shall Overcome, uh, where, where the soundtrack of the Civil Rights Movement. And so Carry On <clears throat> was, of course, this was a very clear that that was what, what the title should be, because obviously it's an allusion to um, the congressman's unfortunate passing um, and that, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants and we have to carry on their work and their legacy, not by doing exactly what they did, but using their, their values as a compass uh, to stay true to what, what we need to overcome in our, in our days ahead. So we all need to carry on. I hope people check out the book. Um, it's, these are the short, stories that congressman tells on different topics like faith and justice and love and but also some interesting um john lewis the man he loved strawberry milkshakes he he loved uh diet cokes he could not stand peanuts because and that was tough being from georgia the peanut state but uh he had peanuts so much as a kid in troy alabama that he didn't he didn't like them growing up <laughs> so just there are little gems in there that um you get to hear about him and his and his cats and so the little gems of John Lewis, the man behind the myth, you know, the, not the, we think about the legend of John Lewis, but there are also this nice slice of life anecdotes that he shares in this very, I think, heartwarming book. And when you were at that point, there's always a moment or two when you finish the book and then you feel that moment where it's done. There's a lot to making a book that a lot of people who haven't done a book don't know about, including tons of editing. <laughs> it always, for me, is a hard part. Um, so when you get to that pace, so it's like, okay, the book is done. It's almost like a child that's born. A project is like a child that's born. How do you feel about this child? Well, you know, it's a book's really, I always feel like a book's never done. It's a work in progress. And that's, and, and I work very closely with um, my friend, the book editor uh, on this, on this project, just, you know, because we had to carry on essentially with his passing and make sure that, uh, what John Lewis said was reflected properly um, on the page. And so it was, uh, it, you know, I, I love this book. I love this man, John Lewis. I love his message. I want more people to know about it. It's certainly, this might've been one of the most difficult book projects I've been involved with because um, the principal passed, passed away in the midst of it. So you just want, you just hope that you get it, that, uh, to what he would have liked. I'm glad you asked that first question. And uh, you just carry on, do the best In you can. In a way, his passing made this book even more important than you might've imagined when you came up with the idea to do it, right? Yeah, and, and just how the book came, came um, 
came to, to be, um, uh, my friend who's an incredible editor, uh, she had worked with him on um, a previous book he had written. And she called me and said she had an, an idea to write this book um, by John Lewis. And, and so we simultaneously reached out to Congressman, Congressman John Lewis and he agreed to take time to, to talk and to, and I'm sure he wanted his, his words, his final reflections, I think, emblazoned on the page. And so that's how the project um, came out. It really was not my idea to create this project. I, I just was uh, there. <laughs> and uh, I got a phone call saying someone, she wanted to do this. And so I, I don't want to take credit for not my idea. I just helped to kind of bring everything together. So um, that's sometimes, you know, you always wear different hats in, in the projects you, you do, but I was blessed to be able to collaborate with, uh, with John Lewis on, on Carry On. Well, it's a wonderful gift to the world and it's a wonderful gift to his legacy. Um, and I think he'd be very proud of your work in, in, in accomplishing. Um, it's uh, July 13th, available on Amazon. I would Everywhere. Believe, right? Everywhere. Yes. And, uh, and the audio book, a great gift that you've got uh, coming out soon as well. Yes, yeah, the audiobook will be available, I believe, the same day, and it's narrated by Don Cheadle, the wonderful actor. How wonderful is that? Maybe he could do the uh, stage play as well. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> wonderful talking to you. It's, it's a treat to have. I know how busy you are, Kabir. Um, you're a very creative man. Um, one last question. What's your next project? Ah, good question. We'll see. I mean, I just, uh, I, we released something by uh, Ted Nash and Glenn Close called Transformation. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very excited with that. That just came out. It's a, it's a big band jazz project about personal tr transformations. Ted's um, son, Eli, went through a gender transition and talks about that. And uh, Ted responds to his son with a beautiful, welcoming, inclusive musical piece. It's like this um, conversation between son and, and father about personal transformation and Glenn Close was principal on the project too. So that's a project we're very excited about um, getting into the world. Glenn's sister, Jessie, got me started in radio. Hmm. Wow. I had right. a Bill Smith store. She came in and said, I want a woman DJ. She had a little cable station in her apartment because as you probably know, their family was trust fund and they had money. And, and so she started that and she got me started in radio. And she, Glenn and her sister, uh, Jessie, live right door next door to each other, have houses literally maybe 20 feet apart there. And, uh, yeah, so no, a wonderful family and she's an amazing woman. So thank you for all of your wonderful projects and your wonderful work. What's the best website to go to to find out more about you? Uh, Kabir.cc and you'll see my blog. You'll, you can you know sign up for my newsletter if you like and where you get my latest um, thinking on the world. And um, however I could be of service, look me up. Maybe we can connect and collaborate on something. Wonderful. Well, you do great service. And thank you so much for your time. It's always a blessing talking to you. Aloha. Aloha.